Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week, we're coming at you with some reviews for two new records. We're going to be talking about the long in the making record, the comeback album from trip hop and dance extraordinaires, everything but the girl, their new album, Fuse. And we're also going to be talking about the singer-songwriter debut from One Miss Cara Jackson. So we've got some two interesting records here to talk about this week. Riley, why don't we get started with Miss Everything But The Girl? I mean, this is a, a very exciting and extremely surprising release. I mean, it was announced. It was surprising when it was announced. Obviously, I've had a bit of time, a few months, to sort of get used to the idea that holy shit, there's going to be a new Everything But the Girl album, which is novel because this is their first album in 24 years. Uh, they were famous. I mean, they came up originally in the 80s. Whole based duo of husband and wife, Ben Watt and Tracy Thorne, came up in the 80s originally with a kind of particular very smooth and well-produced brand of lounge pop that eventually slowly across the many albums they made through the 80s and 90s started to take on the influences of the evolving trends in popular music and in particular the big kind of successful moment they had was in 1994 with their album Amplified Heart and specifically with the remix the Todd Terry club mix of their hit song Missing, which essentially made them famous and was one of the big sort of club hits of the mid 90s and altered the trajectory of the rest of their career in a pretty major way. I mean, they had been incorporating electronic tinges and electronic sounds into their lounge folk based songwriting setup for a while here and there, but it wasn't until the huge success of this song that it became the focus of their music for the remaining records they made. And that led to the twin masterpieces of 1996's Walking Wounded and 1999's Temperamental, which are both two classic down-tempo records, deeply emotional and longing pieces of house music that feature the vocals of Tracy Thorne used to devastating effect. I think that she's one of the greatest pop vocalists of all time even if you know she didn't necessarily have the level of pop success that you might have hoped for for someone with her voice but just within that particular realm of dance music in the 90s and beyond Tracy Thorne's voice is so distinct and stands out so much that in a crowded landscape of house records and down tempo records and ambient jazz records and all these kinds of things from all these different artists everything but the girl's music in that 90s glut is so impossible to ignore because of how powerful Tracy Thorne is as a performer. She's also the vocalist on my absolute favorite Massive Attack song, Protection, one of my favorite songs of all time as well. She was having a run there in the 90s. And after a certain point, you know, I don't know all the details necessarily, but uh, following those twin masterpieces of Walking Wounded and Temperamental, incredible records, can't recommend them highly enough. They essentially got burnt out. And the level of success that they had achieved, as well as the idea of, of continuing to chase that, of continuing to play the game, essentially got to them. Again, they were a husband and wife. They were a couple who'd been making music together for almost 20 years at that point. So they decided this was the logical point to step back, focus on married life, focus on being parents as well, and put things to the side. Now, both of them, Ben Watt and Tracy Thorne, were still involved in various projects over the last two decades, but at no point did it ever seem like everything but the girl were going to reform or that they had any interest in kind of picking up where that left off, especially because they had just moved into very different phases of their lives, essentially. And so, you know, it was with great surprise earlier this year when suddenly they announced very excitingly that they would be back and that they had recorded a new album, a new Everything But The Girl album, their 12th album under that name, the first in 24 years, Fuse. And that was exciting in enough of itself. But then the lead single dropped, which is the song Nothing Left To Lose. And, you know, before this dropped, the idea of everything but the girl reforming. Of course, exciting to me because I love those records that they made, 
but those records they made are very distinctly of their time. I don't want to say they they sound dated because I think that comes with a negative connotation. That's simply not true. They are timeless albums, but the aesthetic and the technology that they're made with is very much tied to that era. And so much has changed and and a lot of what they were doing has fallen out of fashion and some of it can seem to a lot of people to kind of feel a little bit old hat when you revisit it now. So I understand why you know, they don't necessarily have the enduring success and recognition in the modern music landscape uh, of bands like Portishead or Massive Attack, for instance. They were just never quite as ambitious as that. Or if they were ambitious, it was in a more kind of introspective way. And so I had a little bit of trepidation in terms of, okay, well, how are they going to reignite that sound? What are they going to do to make it feel as though the project has a reason to exist in 2023, you know, not to sound ungrateful or anything. I absolutely would celebrate them being back, but you do wonder what are they going to do to make it feel like an everything but the girl album in 2023, as opposed to just another everything but the girl album, the follow-up to temperamental. And all of my concerns were assuaged and just cast aside with the release of this lead single, which is an absolutely pulsing piece of dance music that integrates various influences yes including some of the things they were doing in the 90s but also a lot of things that have happened since then there's a lot of there's a bit of uk garage in here there's a bit of dubstep in here there's a low a melding there's a little bit of edm in here there's a melding of different influences into this new sound on this single that makes it feel incredibly vital. It makes it feel as though not only are everything but the girl revitalizing themselves with the song, but they also appear to be revitalizing subgenres of electronic music and particular sounds that haven't really been in fashion in a long time outside of the UK hip hop scene. So that was really, really exciting. And the song itself is brilliant. It's pulsing, it's vibrant, it's huge. Tracy Thorne's voice, I mean, you can definitely tell that she has aged. Her voice is slightly deeper now than it used to be, but it adds this additional sort of gravitas, and it feels as though it's not really that her voice has changed because it was perfect in the 90s, but that it is that it has evolved and is that it is filled out in a certain way that makes it feel more dynamic even than it ever has been before. So that's one thing that absolutely sells this return. Now, What's interesting about the album, and to be expected if you know anything about everything but the girl or if you've listened to their previous records, is that it's not all in your face, bang, 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 bang dance music. There's a lot of introspection. There's a more than a fair share of ballads on this album. And there's an overall, I don't want to say a somber mood, but there's this sense of reckoning with aging in a way that feels a lot more pointed than they've ever written about before and also very clearly contextualized by the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, this is absolutely unquestionably a pandemic album. And if you're thinking, well, you know, why are we getting, why would I want to listen to a pandemic album in 2023? Like, why are we still doing that? It's not the kind of record that purely luxuriates in the misery of that period or even really writes about it all that consistently in terms of explicit detail but it's so heavily informed by that and it is a wrinkle in the detail of the context of this band who have been away for so long and of the circumstances that reignited their interest and passion for this long dormant project that it feels like an essential fabric of the record and it feels very emotionally moving um, so there's a lot of things that I think are brilliant about this record. There's a lot of things that I think are really savvy and smart about the way that they've returned. But I am already in the bag for everything but the girl. I was already predisposed to really, really enjoy this. Jake, I know that you don't have the history with this band that I do. So I'm curious going, and also I know that as well, just incidentally, and anecdotally, you don't necessarily have the, the most hot track record with house music, which this is essentially at its core, uh, even if it varies from that template in some particularly notable ways. So all that in mind, I'm curious what your take on this was and what your initial response to this album is. Well, I can certainly say that my context informed a bit of trepidation was because I didn't really listen to too much of like the singles and stuff just because I wanted to process the album as a whole wanted to give it the best and fairest shake that I could and 
to be honest, I really didn't have much of an issue or that my, my, you know, notorious house allergy really didn't inform my reaction to this whatsoever, just because there is a lot going on here that I feel like adds to the flavor of the experience. I also was supremely encouraged by the fact that this is, you know, a tight 36 minute long record with like a really rock solid track list and coming from guys who have as storied of a reputation as everything but the girl i was just kind of like you know this really has the air of people who aren't just coming to make music just because but coming back to make music because they have something to say and that's the best compliment i can give uh fuse at the end of the day is that it really does feel like these two had something to say with this record and i think they say it really well this is an album that it's very strange because on the one hand i appreciate its tightness its concision its dedication to being a really potent and effective form of itself i think that the production on here is uniformly stellar as you mentioned, I think that, like, if, if anything, if you haven't listened to this band beforehand, or maybe you uh, have heard select songs or albums from this band and haven't given this a chance, the reason to listen to this album is because of Tracy Thorne. Her vocal presence on here is stunning consistently. She delivers every line, every lyric on here with this tempered immediacy that is beautiful. It's restrained. It's, it's soulful. It's, it's this, it's just this ideal sort of combination that you maybe wouldn't expect from, you know, dance adjacent music of this flavor, I guess, but it's a very unique combination that really carried me through the whole experience really well, but by no means is she the only highlight here. I think, I mean, there was, I believe, I think it was when you actually talked about their album Temperamental last year, you said that that was an album that had hard beats that knock. And for as, you know, much as this is a very atmospheric and kind of dreary at times record, this is also an album that does have hard beats that knock, showcase no better than on Nothing Left to Lose, which is, I mean, Cold Take, probably my, my favorite song on here. It does achieve a kind of ubiquity that I, I find both really, really charming and just very potent atmospherically across this whole record even even when the album decides to shake things up and to maybe be a little bit more slow maybe a bit more contemplative i still think it's handled really really well and the tightness really does sort of lend itself to whenever it deviates from the norm it sticks out but not in a way that's counterintuitive to the experience there are moments on here that really grew on me as the week progressed, uh, moments like uh, When You Mess Up, for example, mm. which struck me as a really strange moment on the record on first listen. But the more I listened to this, the more I just felt cradled by a song like this. Tracy's delivery on here especially is so comforting in a weird way. It's a song that's approaching a kind of vulnerability in a really unique way that is lyrically a lot more multifaceted than I think it appears mm. on first listen. Absolutely. But again, it's a song that just kind of gently gestates with you. That's sort of key to, I think, understanding a lot of what they do on this album is that this is a very lyrical album, probably a more lyrical album than I anticipated and probably more than just I'm used to from acts like this. Like I was more than once reminded of like the production style and the sort of uh, UK garage down tempo dubstep scene of something like Burial, for instance, maybe not as forward thinking as an artist like that. And certainly like his much older stuff rather than his newer stuff. But it, it's all stuff that I'm used to being very textural. And this certainly is. But there is a lot more kind of happening under the hood of this on songs like uh, No One Knows We're Dancing or Karaoke. There's lots of attempts at painting environments, situations, story, characters even, that again, I really appreciate. And I I love all of these qualities of the album. And it really, it, it's sort of something that the more I listen to this, the more I really, really loved the parts of it that leapt out at me. And the more I was simultaneously just a little bit frustrated with some of the things that didn't leap out to me as much. The chief complaint I have here, honestly, is that 
I'm going to do something that we don't often do on this show. I really, really wish this record was longer. There are lots of songs on here that I feel like some of them do feel a bit structurally standard. And I feel like that there are other songs on here that are great at adding detail, that are adding things like unconventional bridges to the end of their songs or just like little details that kind of make the experience feel a bit more ornamental. And there's some of the shorter cuts on here, stuff like Time and Time Again, stuff like Lost, stuff like The Closer Karaoke. There are moments on here where I'm just like, I really think they could have taken these ideas and dragged them out because I enjoy the density of this experience so much. And I just kind of wish I got to linger and last in these moments a bit longer. Though I understand the tendency that they might have to want to come back after such a long absence and infuse something with this level of vitality and not want to overstay their welcome or appear uh, languid or just generally speaking kind of like slow moving or whatever. So I understand the tendency to fight against that. But to me, I, I feel like the, the best thing that this did is that I really want to listen to those classic Everything But The Girl records now. So it really invigorated my curiosity, I guess, with this musical scene as I grow my taste with a an area of music that isn't always to my liking. But this is certainly something that like I got a taste of and now I just really want more of it. Yeah, I mean, the ideal record that you're describing that kind of lets its ideas luxuriate a little bit more is temperamental. Um, this is definitely a very different record for them in a lot of ways, but also at the same time, it feels like it is returning home to their roots spiritually, to almost the place where they began with this much more... Well, see, they've never lost the sense of intimacy, and Tracy Thorne as a performer and as a writer as well has never lost the sense of just very personal an intimate connection that she get, gathers with the listener. And the thing about this record that really, I mean, I think the, the the biggest strength of this record, it has many different strengths, but the biggest strength of this record, and it's a great one to highlight because it showcases how Everything But The Girl differ from a lot of their contemporaries and from a lot of the bands they came up around. And that the biggest strength of this record, I think, is the lyrics. Like Tracy Thorne as a writer is so good she's impeccable she's incredibly involving and she's incredibly emotional and I mean, not just in the power of her voice again the power of her voice is one aspect of that but the way she writes on this record is gentle and involving and emotionally complicated and all of the things that made her special in the 90s but recontextualized and given this newfound urgency and immediacy now and in a lot of senses while this isn't my absolute favorite everything but the girl record it may be the one i connect to the most emotionally because so much of what tracy's writing about is rooted in experiences that i've had and feelings that i can relate to and what's interesting about that is that you know on the one hand the context that she's writing about you know the last few years specifically and how they've affected all of us are things i can relate to but the other kind of theme of this record which is this idea of negotiating aging and how the things that you used to enjoy you know the passions you used to have or the the way you used to live your life changes in its perspective to you as you get older now that's something that i can relate to on some level but certainly not in terms of the way that that i that tracy and ben can but that's the strength of the writing, right, is that I'm pulled into their world. I'm pulled into their musings about, you know, long forgotten days of clubbing and of living a particular lifestyle. That's they. It's not that you miss it. It's not that you wish you could go back to it because that would never work. And in a lot of ways, it would be betraying the beautiful life that you've built for yourself now. But it is just negotiating how your emotions and your relationship with that nostalgia change, how it goes from being something you cling to uh, when you have less security in your life, to something that becomes this almost different person that you relate to less and less as you get more comfort in this new stage of your life. And this sense of intimacy and connection and this idea and the writing, as well as what you see, the immaculate production of Ben Watt, the fact that, again, Ben Watt's someone who's been producing music since the 80s in each decade and has managed to sound completely like he belongs even as trends in electronic music and in pop music change a million fold ben has crafted a set of instrumentals here in a general atmosphere that feels so current that feels so fitting that feels so easy to relate to but the song where this all coheres for me the best song on the record a song that has floored me 
continually. Uh, it was one of the singles as well, but really within the context of the record, I've come to appreciate it more and more. And I think it's one of the best songs we've ever done is Run a Red Light. The second song on this album, which comes off the back of great song, Nothing Left to Lose, that again, very pulsing and, and heavy and just electric opener, which is also my, you know, my second favorite song on the album, right up there as well. But then you just get dropped into this gorgeous space, this vast expanse. And these ghostly piano chords with Tracy's voice reverberating. You know, I think that Tracy's an incredibly technically powerful and talented vocalist. But I think that because she doesn't necessarily perform in the very over the top ways that you might expect of some of our greatest vocalists, not over the top, but in the kind of uh, generous, I suppose, ways that you might expect of some of our greatest vocalists, she doesn't necessarily get this acknowledgement. But while there's plenty of examples throughout their discography of Tracy's voice at its most powerful, nowhere is that better distilled than on Runner Red Light. I mean, listen to the way she sings here. It is completely show-stopping. She's so involving. She pulls you into this tight world as she spins this web. It's the story of, you know, of, of faded nostalgia, of, of looking back on these old memories of being in the clubs, you know, taking a bump of Coke off a car key and then dr- getting into the car and just driving around mm-hmm. and running red lights all night long. There's this complicated emotional relationship that Tracy conveys with this memory slash fantasy that makes it devastating, especially in the way that she's just so plaintively singing. It's 2 a.m. We're leaving loudly. Wake the neighbors. We won't come quietly. They'll all know my name soon. Anyway, run a red light forget the morning this is tonight just lingering in that moment that represents this sense of motion the sense of refusing to stand still and look back and the the irony of singing about this time in your life when you refuse to look back the irony of of doing the of the fact that when you're singing about that you are looking back you're doing the thing that you refuse to do completely when you were young and there's a real naughtiness to that that I, I i just adore and the whole thing completely spellbinds me every time i listen to it you know when you mess up which you mentioned as well incredible song and again you're right to highlight how you know emotionally complicated this song is it's not just you know as simple as you know everyone fucks up and that's okay it understands and navigates the complex ways in which doing something wrong affects your ego and the way that you negotiate your ego when coming to terms with something not working out because of what you've done or something not working out because of where you are but because of how you've responded to the situation that you're in you know it opens with one of my favorite lyrics on the record you seem so young again i think that's because you're in pain that line just completely rips me apart every time I listen to this, it's so incisive and so brutal. And it's almost like the rest of the song doesn't even need to exist because of how hard that line cuts. But the way that she intones to the listener throughout the song, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. For God's sake, have a cigarette and don't stoop to laugh at yourself. I hate people who give me advice is a great line as well that I can relate to deeply, but it's the same. Mm-hmm. It's at the same time. It's this idea of like, when you're in this situation of vulnerability, you simultaneously know you need to rely on others and you need to listen to others, but your, your ego gets in the way of that. And it's just the reality of, of being human, but there's no more powerful conclusion that that Tracy can get when reaching out to this person than just saying forgive yourself over and over and and just saying you know when you mess up it's like an unfinished sentence that doesn't need to be finished when you mess up and baby you'll mess up and Christ we all mess up like there's no end to that when you mess up it's just Mm -hmm. it happens and it happens to us all and it will happen and that's sometimes is I think the best advice you could give someone who's in the situation is not to try and placate them, but just to ground them in the reality of it and the fact that it is a shared reality and just let that thought exist. It's an amazing song. Uh, Caution to the Wind, one of the other more immediate songs with a kind of more pulsing beat on the album as well. And everything about this captures the ecstasy 
of dance music that captures the ecstasy of human connection in that context the 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 core of what that whole movement of music if you could even call it a movement but whatever that whole scene was all about this idea of, of pure connection this and and not even pure pure connection augmented connection connection in all forms this form of home that you find being near someone um in the on the dance floor it's so simple but that that's the point it doesn't need to be ballooned into anything greater in order for you to see the profoundness of it no one knows we're dancing another great song as well i love again you've alluded to this element jake the character based not storytelling necessarily but just the idea of of establishing characters or establishing just a world in these songs where human beings exist with names and lives and letting it's not about going into all the detail and telling a story about those characters it's just about making them feel real and using that as a moment where the listener could kind of see themselves in this world and feel as though they're a part of this place that that tracy is in that she sees feeling connected to her by just understanding people that she observes and she and and she connects with you know that that story she tells or that not story but that little verse that she has about amy who works in a pet shop and mixes vodka with cola and knows everybody's name and yeah. that's how she's remembered that's how this person is remembered and it's a few small details that might to them seem completely you know, incidental, but it's, it'll stick with me. There's the incredible, one of the big highlights of the back half, the song forever, one of the most pulsing, great, great, one of the greatest beats on the album as well. And a lot of, it feels like thematically it, it builds on when you mess up as well, talking about being able to let go of pain and shame and being able to even burn down your past or burn down the things that are holding you back and really feeling a freedom, even if it's a freedom in an aspiration or an idea that you just can hold on to. It's really, really powerful. The song that most directly alludes to the lockdown, the song Lost, uh, which is a very well, one of the simplest songs on the record both musically and lyrically lyrically it's just a single repetitive motif of things that the, this person has lost and it's quite beautiful and effective in the sense that it it discuss it mentions and and brings up all of these different types of loss and in doing so unifies them under this umbrella of 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 universal suffering essentially it doesn't matter what you've lost the idea of loss is universal and the pain of loss is incalculable it's it's like it's it's not a thing you can understand all you can know is that it is universal and shared and complicated and multifaceted and 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 everything is losable basically and and the way that it just all boils down to you know i lost this i lost that i lost all of these you know it's actually um it's kind of neat the way it's structured in the sense that it starts out with the loss of things that are a little bit more trivial or not necessarily even concrete uh and and then it turns into like material things that are lost and then it turns into you know friendships and connections that are lost and then it turns into you know people who have died and then it just becomes a, an ebbing endless loss of self i just lost it over and over and over it's a that to me, like this is one of the most effective songs and one of the most incisive and I guess emotionally potent songs I think that's ever been written about the pandemic. To me, it just distills so much of that into such a simple idea that doesn't need to be bloated beyond that in any way. There's the song Interior Space where Tracy talks about this weird relationship she has with her own body as she ages, you know, the sense of, she talks a bit explicitly about going through menopause and then, you know, the pro that process having being made to reflect on her value as a person, her value as a woman and the way in which, you know, these thoughts make her feel more alien to herself and to her humanity and to her womanhood and, and all of these kinds of things, you know, this awareness of your interior space that becomes so much more ever present the older you get i'm all blood and bone tissue and stone my head is an alien place it's a, a really affecting and and dark and brutal song 
karaoke as well is it's a perfect way to end the album because it's um it's a meta song in a certain sense you know do you sing to heal the broken hearted or do you sing to get the party started you know the implicit implication being that both of these things are a core part of what tracy does and that her contribution to the world may be infinitesimally small and may exist in one particular lane but ultimately it is an act of healing it is an act of helping others to heal it is an act of healing herself and the whole album to me if i had to sum it up in one word is about healing it's about how we do that how we figure out how to do that how we try to help others to do that how we fail to do that within ourselves and sometimes how it happens to us when we least expect it when we've been suffering for so long and we eventually realize that we are healing and in some ways, the process of suffering is the process of healing. That's, I think, the album. And I'm, I, I've been really taken with this all week. Yeah, it's not a, a a masterpiece necessarily. It is not the sweeping, grand statement that some of their later records in the '90s were. It's been very easy to listen to for me this week, and it's somewhat slightness is almost deceptive in a certain sense because it creates a situation where each time I listen to it, I feel like I'm uncovering new depths. I feel like it's resonating with me in a new way, like you described as well with certain songs. So I think it's a really special record. I think it's a great comeback album. I think it's a great COVID record in a weird way. I think it's a great <laughs> dance record. I think it's a it's basically great at everything that it evokes in me and that it talks about, and it's just great to have it. It's a comeback album from an artist who's been gone for multiple decades in an already kind of under the radar sect of music. So I feel like the reception to this has maybe been a little bit muted, but this is an album that despite its length and despite that status, it's something that on first listen, I probably would have said to bring back a phrase we've used before in this podcast is an album that's maybe more good for its sound and less its songs but on on multiple listens i uncovered that it was a lot more than that there's a lot mm. denser of a core here and while i do kind of wish that it was a little bit more fully formed of a record i still appreciate the duo's dedication to creating a concise experience that still gives you a really sizable vertical slice of what makes them a great duo and really gives me an appreciation for this genre and their music in general. I, I can't wait to go back and listen to stuff like Temperamental, for example. So mm -hmm. there's that. Yeah, it's just, it's cool to be be talking about a, a record on a band like this in the context that we are. You know, Increasingly, I'm aware as we do mm -hmm. this for longer and longer that anything's possible. <laughs> You know, you know, bands get is, re revive yeah, their true. careers after, you know, untold amounts of time. And we get to review something or we discover something that we get to talk about that. So that we've never talked about anything like it before. And I'm not saying this is that necessarily, mm -hmm. but this is something that, you know, one of many examples this year and, and in recent years that have made me more keenly aware of that. And I think this is a record as well that is a good is a teachable moment in a certain sense and that it's a great way. It's a great example of a record that really does reveal hidden depths the more time you spend with it, but also does not demand very much of you in order to get there either. It has this simplicity, no. this immediacy, this very consumable tone to it, but also this, the things that it has to say, this, the, the psychological and, and sociological and, you know, emotional things that it has to say i think are profound and they are profound in the way that only a great writer can be when they are when they never feel as though they're trying to reach for profundity it's a beautiful album and i will be revisiting it throughout the year favorite track here is nothing left to lose um gonna go sign the love for run a red light that's an amazing way to open up the album with those two songs and for a more deep cut favorite, I'll say, yeah, when you mess it up, just because I had a nice little arc with that song, and I, I really appreciate it, what it adds to that sort of first leg of the album. Uh, least favorite song on here? Probably, 
I think I might say time and time again, just because that's the one song on here where like it's not even necessarily the song I have the the least amount of affinity for. It's the it's the song that I'm so upset doesn't do more with itself because I really like the core of it. It just doesn't really seem like it's interested in being much beyond the core of itself. So I'll pick that one. Uh, an enthusiastic 6.5 out of 10 from me. There are some times where I'm just like, you know, we we get on board with something more or less than each other or, or sometimes exactly the same. But like we, we, we view and recognize strengths so in such synchrony that it just makes me laugh because I, before you said any of that, the exact same three favorite tracks, the exact same least favorite track. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to give it a seven. I just on the whole enjoy it that little bit more. But overall, I, I'm pre- we're pretty much in, in basic agreement that this is a really special record that you should check out. All right, let's move into our second review of the day, which, you know, we're going from a legacy act to someone who's somewhat fresher on the scene. One Miss Cara Jackson with her new album, Why Does the Earth Give Us People to Love? Now, typically when we review records on this variant of our show, the new release reviews variant of our show, we typically review albums that came out the week before we were recording this, or usually about um, nine or ten days from before when this came up, depending on when the video goes live. This album came out a couple of weeks ago, so it's a bit further back than the stuff we typically review, Uh, but I wasn't cognizant of Kara at the time it came out. I missed this one initially, and it wasn't until it got recommendations from our one-time podcast guest Mika who considers it one of the best albums of the year and also from Stephen Hyden who recommended it as his album of the week on IndieCast last week I was like okay I need to check this out and immediately within five or ten minutes of starting the album I knew this is something we have to review on Jams and Tea because not only is it a great record which I do think it is but there is also a lot to the substance of what Kara is writing about and to the intensity of the way this record emotionally lands that feels like it's too good for us jake and riley of jams and tea not to (laughs) acknowledge and talk about because you know we could mention this in a passing segment on a now episode but i think we would be doing it a disservice by not giving it the time that it deserves to unpack because this is this is an emotional album this is a a dense album it is an album with a lot of beauty and a lot of ugliness as stupid and reductive as that can sound, but it really is. And it is an album from an artist who arrived so fully formed in the music world that it's kind of intimidating, frankly, the thought of even talking about her, but Cara Jackson's not just some no one who's made a record. Kara Jackson is the United States National Youth Poet Laureate, or was from 2019 from to 2020. Uh, she's a heavily established and very successful poet and songwriter. And this is her debut album, but she has been making music for some time. And, and as you would expect from the Poet Laureate title, she's been writing for some time as well. An incredibly talented and incredibly exciting person to follow and someone who's going to be completely on my radar in all senses from now on because as as uh, has been known to happen this one really blindsided me this one really socked me in the face and i've been reeling ever since uh this is a really special record car is a really special writer there's a lot that car car is writing about on this record that feels painfully relatable to me that feels like an unfortunate reality for a lot of people our age i think car is around our age if not a little bit younger and there's a lot that what of what Kara does here of the kind of feelings that she communicates and the kind of truth that she speaks to that I recognize from a lot of the artists we've talked about in the past, a lot of the most celebrated indie singer songwriter artists of the last few years. But I think that Kara speaks to a lot of those things and to a lot more things with more depth, with more incision, with more brutality and with more grit than 
a lot of singer songwriters these days do and it's not that's not a sneak diss it's just a reflection of the way Kara writes not to mention the fact that musically especially for a debut record i found this to be incredibly accomplished many of the arrangements here though most of them do exist to form a bedrock for Kara's writing and singing Many of the arrangements here I thought were stunning, particularly on songs like Brain, on songs like No Fun Slash Party, on songs like Free, Rat, the title track, and believe me, I have thoughts on many of them. Um, Jake, this is another instance of me kind of discovering something and sort of foisting it upon you. I'm very curious as well, given your inclinations and the things that you enjoy in songwriting and in music in recent years what your take is on this particular artist and what she's doing with this album overall i think it's really awesome to see someone like cara jackson combining the different elements that she is because this is clearly an album and a sound that comes from it's not quite a bedroom or like lo-fi sense but this is a very scrappy album but also it doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like rough there is a lot of attention to detail here there's a lot of instrumental diversity on here in fact it's just it feels like a conscious choice in more respects than just one maybe without you know the excessive polish on specific records of uh, the artist I'm about to compare her to with the writing on here and the delivery and just the perspective and a maturity, I guess that a lot of this is written with. I was reminded frequently of people like Fiona Apple, uh, specifically with records like when the pawn, for instance. Um, but I was also just as much reminded as, you know, uh, the, the, the folk singer songwriter greats. There are multiple points on here where I was reminded of the storytelling and songs you would find on like a classic Dylan record. And if you want something a bit more like uh, tangible and modern and relevant in terms of comparison, I think that it's not necessarily exactly the same just because I feel like there's a lot more edge to what Cara is doing here. And it's a lot less specifically mainstream, but like I noted a lot of similarities between Cara's writing style and that of Lucy Dacus. In fact, this whole album actually thematically speaking reminded me a lot of home video and then a lot of this album is kind of about the burden of empathy, the sort of burden of connection to other person, not necessarily in like being in a bad relationship or in a relationship with someone else who's dragging you down or whatever. In fact, I think that's one of the strengths of the record is that Cara veers away from that very smartly and attempts to lend a lot of the people who are in a romantic relationship with her or just men in general or masculinity in general she tends to humanize it but without also you know shying away from its ugliness from the ways that it mistreats people from the ways that it mistreats her but never abandoning that for a sense of one dimensionality hell there's a, more than a couple similarities between this and for example the debut record from somebody like and that I think that it examines her relationship to masculinity very pointedly. And I feel like I knew I was in for something special as soon as the opening track recognized, which is just this minute long kind of sparse piano thing that goes directly into No Fun and Party, which I think is the best song on here. And this song is just outstanding. It's a huge emotional sucker punch that just, again, it examines her relationship to being in a relationship and the kind of person that she is and contextualizing it very, very robustly throughout the course of the record. And there, you know, this album has songs on it, like Dickhead Blues, for example, which I think is the uh, song that I most thought of somebody like Fiona Apple, where, you know, you would expect her to take a very, just from that title alone, maybe a more one-dimensional approach to the material here, but she doesn't. Maybe at first it seems like she's sort of lampooning this idea 
of, you know, a man or just men in general who kind of put her down or the type of men that she's attracted to. But she goes into why she's attracted to this kind of person or why she's veered away from the more sensitive types that have uh, sort of done her wrong in the past, which is a recurring theme along the album of her doing away with the kind of sensitive artist sort of uh, singer songwriter types that tend to also sing about relationships very pointedly, uh, notably on songs like the absolutely stunning, nearly eight minute long, Rat. which is the most Dylan-esque thing on here in terms of storytelling. It's just, it's it goes about telling it, the story of this main character who she refers to as Rat, uh, and just kind of painting a portrait of them very singularly. It almost exists on an island from the rest of the record. But it, it's a really, really compelling list and all things considered. I think that maybe the only thing that holds me back is that structurally, I find this to be a little bit all over the place. I won't even necessarily say that it is lopsided. It's just it, it, the way that it flows is unconventional. And I won't even say that it doesn't work. But there are a lot of more insubstantial moments here that are almost like the, the stark contrast between the one minute long, two minute long, or even some of the three minute long songs and the way more ambitious songs on here, like uh, the title track, for instance, which really, really compelling song. The first half of which it just it starts off and ends in two totally different places. It has like this funnel structure where it starts out being like this wide breadth and it becomes more and more personal as it goes along. Uh, and it's just it's a really interesting lyrical shakeup. And then there are songs on here that, while good and while do contribute to the theme of the album, are almost cartoonishly more one-dimensional than these moments. And not to denigrate them, that can work sometimes. Uh, sometimes, like, the transition in and out of other songs, like, I actually do think that Recognized and No Fun Party, like, that, that is actually a really effective transition. But it leads these moments to just, you really hone in on what you love about an album like this and with what maybe doesn't work for you as much you're just kind of like kind of waiting to get to those different moments so there are just kind of points on here where I'm innately more compelled to the more substantial stuff than I am the less substantial stuff but Kara as a presence is wonderful the writing is terrific it's really ambitious she's pulling from a lot of different places and the way that she kind of leans in to the sort of languidness of how she kind of draws out some of her syllables sometimes is beautiful i really love that it adds another great sort of sonic edge to all of this it's really emotional it's really deeply compelling it just it really does go for the gut on some of those songs moments that will take your breath away if you get on its wavelength uh a bit rough shot sure uh but this is the kind of album that i'm just like i am locked into whatever she's going to be doing for the next like you know decade at least because she's showing an incredible amount of promise on here absolutely i mean here's my take on the on the structure issue i suppose and and none of this is to you know denigrate or reduce your opinion it's just my take uh i, I view this album a lot like reading a collection of poetry uh, and, and maybe that's just informed by the knowledge that that Kara is a poet and has been a poet before having a music career but to me it is like reading a book of poems in a certain sense or like having this augmented experience of having them essentially brought to life in front of you and you know when I read a book of poetry some poems are really short and some and sometimes blunt in certain ways and some poems are more exploratory and lengthier and that is sort of just the nature of the form it's not an issue i have in that format and it's not necessarily an issue i have here although i will say certainly my favorite moments are the moments on the record where kara delves into a particular idea or explores a particular song or a particular world for a longer period of time but I think that those moments are buffeted by the shorter moments in really effective ways that kind of cut through the mire and the gloom and the emotional fugue that Kara can get lost in. And so to me, that dissonance, not necessarily that dissonance, but that contrast is a core part of, I think, what makes the record work. Um, so Kara does, she opens up with this motif of recognition with that first track, this idea 
of the fact that there is nothing that people won't do essentially to be recognized, to be seen. Um, and the the idea, the use of the word recognized uh, in this song is a really interesting choice, right? Because the idea is some people do this to be recognized. Some people do that to be recognized. Some people do this to be recognized. Not to yeah. be, there's any word she could have chosen, not necessarily to be seen, not even necessarily to be acknowledged, but recognized. Recognition, this idea of being recognized is an idea that's developed different meanings in the modern era and the modern parlance i think than what it used to have it's not just about because so, when you say i feel recognized or i'm recognized or i recognize that it's not necessarily just about being able to identify it but being able to understand it so in the use of this particular word as well it's it kara makes clear that this idea she's playing with is not just this idea about being identified but being able to feel as though that the ultimate thing that matters is being understood for people and she does kind of set up i like what you said that idea of the, the the burden of empathy this idea that the ability to understand others and the desire to understand others ultimately brings with it an a particularly unique wave of psychological and emotional burden when you carry that and when you care, and it's the kind of thing that is very easy to make fun of and ridicule because this idea of, you know, I care so much, it's a burden. Uh, and, and people who say things like that tend to be very facetious and tend to be, you know, very self-serving in the way they weaponize that. But it is a real phenomenon, right? There's this real thing where when... If anything, the record itself proves that. Yeah. And, and so... Kara explores that and really interesting ideas, the ways in which her connections to other people and her ability to understand them, or at least feel as though she does as well, because understanding another person is always a subjective thing. We, we believe we understand another person. It's something we tell ourselves, you know, unless we're explicitly told by another person. But anyway, there's this idea of, of the effect, the cumulative effect that comes with that on negotiating your own identity and your own problems and your own, mission to better yourself and the other prevailing theme of the record as well that kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with this is ego right so the throughout this record you have songs that are specifically about people who have very self-serving and very selfish desires and whether intentionally or not ultimately manipulate and use people and, and the course of looking to serve those desires and Kara, of course doesn't see herself as exempt from this i mean if anything the whole point of the record is that it's a fundamentally human trait uh even though the effects of that tend to be more harmful than positive but she explores it throughout the record often in ways that relate to people in her life a uh, dick here blues is the particularly compelling song in that it seems to be and I'm only contextualizing this from the voicemail that starts the song. And it seems to be a song where Kara is singing about her father. And so in a lot of the songs in this record, Kara th sings about male figures in her life. And there is this um, femininity dynamic and this kind of commentary on masculinity that forms a thread, thread throughout the record. But this is the only song on the record where I can explicitly tie that to fatherhood. And obviously when you're talking about when you're a female artist talking about masculinity, you know, the lines get blurred between fathers and brothers and boyfriends and friends and these all these different men performing different male roles in your life and how they exist in particular contexts, but the underlying masculinity can make them, you know, essentially the same self-serving organism. But the the context of that voicemail at the start of this song, giving this a particular, very clear context of okay, so this song is going to be Kara talking about her father. That just adds this extra edge to it that, you know, here's the thing, like I typically tend to favor when there's a deliberate ambiguity and a deliberate lack of clarity in terms of who the song is about. So you can apply these contexts or the specific barbs that are being thrown to different potential figures in this person's life. But here, when you have that deliberate context given to you before the fact, it's in such a way that it completely changes how you experience the song before it's even begun. It can be really, really effective. It shouldn't be something that's used all the time, but when it is used sparingly and when it is used with purpose, like it is here, it completely changes the tone of the song and makes it you know, a really great song about having a fucking shitty father who is self-serving and who essentially 
it, especially the context of that voicemail it's not just you know here's something to show that the song is about my father it's specifically that the context of the father who is absent but who makes these very you know like two-dimensional efforts to kind of reach out and be a part of this person's life even though you know they don't really have much of an interest in actually making an effort beyond that um it's really funny that that the voicemail ends with that you know keep killing him smack a white man i'll talk to you later line this idea that you know he's trying to you know empower her in a certain sense as a manipulative tactic essentially to to make her feel as though he's on her side and um and maybe he believes that he is i'm getting into a lot of of paternal psychology here i need to step away from this but but it's just there's a lot in the choice yes. of, of including that that adds so much to the song to me and it is like the song about her father the song about this you know th this particularly shaggy and ragged and thoughtless person in her life being one of the ones that lyrically is one of the more cutting and just brusque and to the point and a lot of her metaphors and similes and, and wordplay on this are some of the more you know um less flowery and more sort of just ugly on the record you know my dilemma is always a dickhead who's drunk on the daily news like coyotes and culottes clawing for coffee and open-toed shoes i am no longer amused by losers who find themselves losing me that line i also thought of fear and apple that line specifically is exactly the kind of thing she would write. I'm no longer amused by losers who find themselves losing me. In yeah. fact, I'm almost convinced that is a Fiona Apple lyric that she's repurposed and I just can't think of it. Um, but again, the way that <laughs> the way that she there's such subtle just brutality in her songwriting, the way she twists it around to this being being the self-affirmational thought of I'm not as worthless as I once thought. I'm pretty top notch. You know, the way that that choice of words, the way she phrases that, it just perfectly captures that thing where it's like you are trying to believe in your own self-worth, but you're self-aware of the of how kind of corny that looks and how kind of inherently fake it is to be buying into that. But also at the same time, how important it is to genuinely believe you have self-worth. Uh, even though that whole thing, the whole culture of self-worth is kind of contorted into this funhouse circus pop psychology joke. It's just a great song. <laughs> and I have to be careful here because I could do these kinds of five minute analyses of every song on this record. You know, the sequencing is so great. Dickie Blues going into therapy is so good because here you have with this very short song, Kara tying together all the men in her life essentially and unifying them into one particular archetype every man thinks i'm his fucking mother good for milk and good for supper special someone when he suffers and she does this really great and really subtle thing in this song that is like one of the most probably the best and most incisive commentary on masculinity on the whole record this little refrain at the end where she's like he wants me and at the same time she's backing her own voice doing saying he wants he so it's he wants me and he wants he at the same time this idea of these simultaneous desires coming from this male figure he wants her he wants to possess her he wants to be able to feel as though he can suck the life out of her but ultimately that is self-serving he wants himself he wants to feel better about himself the want for her and the want for himself are one and the same and then <laughs> contrasting that with he wants therapy the inevitable you know moment that every that every you have with every shitty man where you call him out on his bullshit and he's like he realizes he can't squirrel out of it so he's like yeah i'm fucked up you're right i need to you know get help i need to go to therapy i need to talk to someone i'm gonna do better and then it's a cycle right it goes back into the self-serving desires after that it's so effective and she, again, this is why Kara is a great poet, because she doesn't draw attention to what she's doing in any kind of overt way. She uses cutting language, and she can be very direct, but the undercurrent and the effect of what she's doing is something you don't pick up on until you really sit down and think about it. And that's just in the tiniest little moments on this album. You know, structurally, a lot of the shorter tracks are earlier on, and so you do kind of get this feel musically, more so than lyrically, because lyrically across these songs there's a lot of contiguity to me yeah there's different tracks and some are shorter than others but it feels as though if you ignore that a lot of it is very contiguous in terms of what Kara is saying 
but musically you have some short ideas and you have some longer ideas so it feels in a certain sense as though the album's kind of unfurling as you go through it and it and it, it starts really it has those strong early centerpiece moments with um no party fun no fun party that one and dickhead blues and then it's not really until you get to the song brain that the album kind of settles into these sort of more languorous musical ideas that Kara kind of bathes in for a while and uh, this is uh, one of my favorite lyrics on the on the album sleep isn't cheap and your love is no currency like oh my god if you have never been lying in bed with someone Oof. and had a thought in your head that is essentially what this lyric is then you won't really be able to fully relate to this song but Kara says something in words that are so poetic and so much more of a beautiful expression of that idea than anyone's ever said before that it feels like the final yeah, it feels like the final word on the subject like this idea of ha- being in this intimate situation with someone and ultimately feeling as though that intimacy is basically draining you rather than refilling you you've got to tell me you're ready so i can sleep already if you, i that if I go, I, it would be too, it would be TMI for me to explain why I resonate with that particular lyric, but boy, do I. And just to kind of broaden it, as she's getting into these, you know, very barbed wired, brutal expressions, and these songs are kind of starting to uh, really settle, the arrangements on these tracks really sneak up on you. And I didn't necessarily appreciate this the first time. The night I listened to this, I listened to it twice in the space of like four hours because i was so entranced by cara the first time i had to go back and appreciate how she was building these arrangements to establish what she's doing and to fill it out in really meaningful and nuanced ways like the song free which to me is like this is the first of the major long songs on the record and the first time i listened to this i it was night i was walking through the city i don't know i just decided to do that while listening to this and it was just completely transfixing. I was absorbed in this experience totally. I felt as though the entire world had crumbled away, but I was staring at, at lights and cars and people. And I was just so absorbed in this experience. And it felt really fitting as well, because it was this song about existing within the different roles that you fill in your life and feeling total disconnection from those roles feeling a a sense of alienation and resentment towards the people that hold you in those roles and ultimately rejecting that and like just embracing a freedom that you dictate for yourself this song musically is stunning there are these little horn trills like in the early half of the song that feel straight out of like nicholas Brattel's score for uh beale street if Beale Street could talk. And the whole <laughs> thing has yeah. this just expansive lushness to it that so beautifully underlines this desire of this internal boundlessness that you experience in your mind, even as you're in these suffocating relationships. Or this internal boundness that you fantasize about, that you that you dream about, that you long to escape into. Yeah, I mean... I, I, I'm going to completely stop, steamroll the whole record. So I'll step back at this point and ask if you have anything you want to add about other specific songs at this point that have resonated with you. I obviously les- resonate with a lot of the lyricism on here just because, you know, it, it's kind of like you said, it could be easy to lump somebody like Car or just like the, the the sentiments on here into that whole just like, uh, bah, uh empath nonsense but no here if anything it's the the album sort of proving its own point because it's a testament to that burden if nothing else it's like her consistently kind of going back and drawing from the well of these these specific kinds of people this is ultimately what proves the album's thesis that that is again a huge strength of the record is that it's kind of it's like an artistic modesty because a lot of what's on here too is that sort of Kara kind of reaffirming herself or attempting to sort of 
actualize or to just sort of point herself in the right direction, give herself self-esteem to just kind of move on from some of these things. And it's not done with like, you know, she's obviously struggling with it. it there, there's a push and pull with that on the record. But at the same time, there's a sort of allure of why this was a problem for her in the first place. And that leads me to really gravitate at least towards the more tender and sparse moments on here like again rat for being the almost eight minute long epic that it is is a really kind of lower key song that really lets you pay attention to its little nuances and everything and it it, it's such a detailed and involving story it feels like you're watching a movie when like i mean to say it's cinematic almost reduces it but it's like when this song is on it almost exists totally separately from the album to me and i'm just with this the entire time it's so ruthlessly compelling absolutely i mean i'm gonna get to rap very momentarily uh just to forecast that's my favorite song on the record i have a lot of thoughts i want to again just going back to flow and songwriting free into lily seamless like the first time i listened to this i didn't realize they were different mm. songs but also <laughs> this idea of of what's happening in free obviously this sense with which this rebellious pushing against the constraints of the role that the people in your lives typically men for kara constrain her into and lily i know i don't know who lily is it's a song that seems to be directed towards this person this figure who kara encourages to step out of their own boundaries and to be free in the same sense that kara has reclaimed her own freedom and you know my little hit theory slash interpretation is that this is an extent because this song flows so seamlessly out of free this almost to me feels like an extension of that song in the sense that Lily is this embodiment or this internal version of herself, essentially, that she's writing this song to an inner child, I guess, if you want to use that really stupid term. There's a million songs I could write you up to extract our love, build a statue of, it outlives us. You and I both know how this goes. I'm going to leave my home and you have to leave your own for that Minnesota cold. There's such a sense of the inevitability of the future and of moving on and stepping into a part of your life that's full of unknowns that requires a lot of strength. That means you have to leave behind things that have built up a foundation for you because those things have become limiting or toxic or whatever. You have to step away from that. And Lily is a song that, you know, it's one thing with free to say, you know, I'm free. Fuck you. I don't need you. And Lily's kind of like this grounding moment where you're like, okay, I can be free, but it's not that easy. And I love that. And then Rat comes up yeah. next. And Rat and the title track, back to back, two best songs on the album. I think these songs are unreal. <laughs> I, I This is the point on the record where I feel like, and you kind of describing it as film-like, I resonate with that. It feels very much like that. But I feel like at this point in the record, with these two songs in particular, I've stepped out of listening to an album or even reading a book of poetry, and I've stepped inside some thing that's happening around me that I'm frozen, this moment that I'm frozen within. I'm trying not to be pretentious and stupid about it, but it really is something shifts for me at this point. And Rat is a song that, you know, it's really hard for me as a Steely Dan fan to not acknowledge the very clear connections between this song and Deacon Blues off of Asia. They're both about very similar figures. They both tell a very similar story. And, you know, Deacon Blues is kind of like in the American songbook. It's the kind of archetypical song about the, you know, the the, the faded loser who dreams of glory and is willing to burn down everything in his life and essentially throw himself to the lions, basically, in the pursuit of that glory. You know, this person who fundamentally has no sense of self-worth, but attaches themselves to the idea of fame, attaches themselves to the idea of glory, to the idea of being recognized, of being remembered, and essentially burns their entire life to the ground in order to have that recognition. You know, Deacon Blues, one of the greatest songs ever written. And that I core idea of it, that tragic figure at the center of it, you know, that's a really compelling songwriting fixture that over the years, many artists have written their story of this archetype. And Kara Jackson's Rat is another 
entry into that playbook and it is every bit as good and every bit as effective and wholly and completely Kara's own. I mean, I do not just, I'm not just making that comparison to, you know, reduce it or to say, you know, this is decomposed. It is the same sort of archetype, but Kara is very much doing her own thing with it. It has this, and again, this is where you've kind of been primed for these longer tracks because you've had a couple of them leading up to this point, but Rat is something else. You're so immediately infused into this world that that Kara is telling of this figure who, you know, is to so full of shit, essentially, who completely deludes themselves with all of their beliefs, is a musician like the character in Deacon Blues, and romanticizes the idea of the road and of travel and of touring essentially and of course any musician writing about touring in any context there's going to be a meta comp component to it um this sense with which this character is terrible in all of his relationships because of course he is because he's so single-minded because recognition from some ephemeral world that he sees uh, is the only thing that matters to him you know, and, and the way in which this album, this song re continually evokes the road, continually evokes, you know, the, the language of traveling, you know, car wheels and, and those sorts of things continually grounds the story in the sense of, of forward movement. This character is constantly someone who is never staying in one place, who is never able to be still, because if they had to be still for two seconds, they would start introspecting and it, their whole world would crumble around them. And as this story goes on, this constant motion, and again, the instrumental is is just beautifully giving you that bedrock to Kara's lyricism, right? You're completely taken along this journey and this constant movement towards an, some unknown but undeniably tragic end. And there's this sense with which Kara's fascination with the internal workings of this person's mind, of understanding how their single-minded focus affects the way they view the people in, in their life. You know, it starts to reflect back on songs like Dickhead Blues, on songs like Therapy, on songs like Brain as well. And, for, and, and basically every song on the record up to this point gets reflected in Kara's fascinations with the internal workings of this character. This, the story as it goes on, the way it intensifies, you know, the story of Rat who headed west, his brain hallucinating, his ego in his chest, his friends they never told him it had cost him close to death. At home his woman carves another kind of casket, the kind he gladly climbs and closes himself in. It's a simultaneously inevitable but inconclusive end to the song that leaves it in this devastating place. The same, And it's the same sort of tone that Deacon Blues ends on as well. I, I just can't help but make that comparison continually. I this is like it's great american songbook stuff and it is masterful work from kara and then you get the title track and if i'm not already emotionally exhausted from listening to this album and you fucking know <laughs> i am by this point this song this fucking song how dare she how dare she write this song <laughs> How dare she take me through this journey up until this point on the album of, you know, reckoning with this inherent selfishness and in everyone you see, this inherent desire for recognition, and also bring all of that into the world of the personal here. Because, yeah, Kara is cursed with her ability to, to see and understand the people that are around her and to fundamentally get their selfishness and be burdened by it and be used by it and be allow herself to be made vulnerable by it and then that vulnerability that sense with which no matter how much self-worth you have no matter how much sense of confidence and pride and comfort you have in your own life the connections you develop to others may, will ultimately make you vulnerable in a way that you could never overcome and that vulnerability at its most unavoidable and it's most devastating is the vulnerability of grief and grief is all consuming grief is the kind of i mean you don't need to tell me to tell you what grief is but kara understands what grief is kara is clearly someone who's experienced different kinds of grief i mean a lot of people who write about it tell you about the different kinds of grief it's not just the grief of someone dying it's a grief of of any kind of loss but also just even within that loss the nature of grief is so unpredictable and so 
alien and so all consuming and this is really as great a song that's as has ever been written about the all-consuming nature of grief here Kara is you know arms wide open opining to the universe why does the earth give us people to love then take them away out of reach it's like the the al the song starts with that very simple and very hard hitting you know thought and then it goes through all of these different complex iterations of that thought and ultimately ends in a hyper specific personal context reiterating that same thought you know why does the earth make us fill up the church when the answers are beneath our feet i've buried old and young i've watched them lower a saint who are only waiting our turn call that living why does the earth give us people to love then give them a sickness that kills and why does the earth make us pay for the dirt are you saying the dead pay the bills like aiming arrows at my eye scraping the skin off my thigh trained my corneas not to cry but they will not obey this time when we could barely read i stood beneath your latest masterpiece you collected colored pencils and sharpened them when they got weak but when you should sharpen me the angels license you to leave I love that. I love the way that Kara is basically blindsiding you with personal details as the song goes on. It starts as this almost philosophical treatise on the callous, uncaring nature of the universe. And suddenly, without warning, Kara is talking to us about someone very specific in her life who died. And you, you don't get to prepare for that. It just happens. At the age of 17, your knees were weaker than a sheet and I was in disbelief. The sight of you was vanishing. We were going to start a band, hijack my folks' minivan, actualize our silly plans, the lifelines written in our hands. I'll make a promise to you then. If we can ever sing again, you sing those high nights high. My friend, I'll sing the low notes in the end. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I've already said it. It is this song that ties together that just, brutal overwhelming uncaring of the universe and that realization that your grief doesn't have any greater meaning and then just brutally tying that to a specific experience of grief that is essentially the prompting these thoughts you know typically a more a simpler songwriter or someone who's approaching this idea in a different and more obvious way would sing these two parts of the songs in a reverse order, right? It would start with the personal story and then end up reflecting on the treatise of, you know, why does the earth do this to us? Yada, yada, yada. But Kara does it in the reverse order. Kara asks those questions, those obvious, but still pointed questions, and then makes them hit harder by giving the context afterwards. It's again, it's, it's just incredible. It's the same sort of, careful arrangement of the deployment of information that makes Dickie Blues powerful, but in a completely different way. And then Kara continues her, you know, her preponderance with death into curtains as well, you know, uh, which is a song that takes Kara's grief and the sense of anger and revulsion with the universe that it inspires and turns it inwards and basically reflects on how none of this knowledge feels as though it helps her in any way you know i know i'm young but i'm not naive the kings will survive everything i'm afraid this game we play will kill me even if i stay play this game for paper's sake just to have my name erased you're not the savior i've paid for knowledge is a curse in a lot of ways and understanding is a curse and again we're coming full circle because that's the idea we started from that feeling as though you get other people and feeling as though you understand the world and having that knowledge it doesn't help it makes things harder it's a kind of freedom but it's a kind of prison in its own way and Kara, as the record gets so expansive and and all-consuming and it's in its first half towards that midsection, it ultimately retracts inward in its final stretch with these songs. Kara, in appreciating all of the ugliness and the complications of reality, basically retreats inward, right? Revisits the, the recognition idea from the start of the record, the recognized reprise, but this time 
it's just the last line of that opening track over and over again. A lot of people going to die. A lot of people going to die. Like no longer is Kara, you know, uh, having this treatise on recognition and how people will spend their entire lives seeking this desire to be understood. You know, she's completely subsumed in her grief and in her mortality by this point. So everything else that surrounded that idea of a lot of people going to die to be recognized, even the recognition part is gone. It's just this gulf, this blackness, this void. And then liquor is an interesting epilogue to all of that. I, I This is the one moment that I'm not 100% sure works for me, um, but I... But I appreciate it, again, as a curveball that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into my interpretation of how this record's going. Um, essentially, it's just a moment where Kara is... I picture her sitting on a high cliff top, you know, with a bottle of vodka or something, just essentially cursing the world. And it's an epilogue to that. And I guess it fits, I suppose. It's where else there's no real necessarily logical place for the record to end after the despondency of curtains and the recognized reprise. So why not just sort of sit back and laugh at it? This kind of, you know, hysterical laughter in the face of your own powerlessness. And it may be that's a very cynical read of the direction of the record, but it's the read I get and I connect to it deeply. It's a record about, you know, starting in this place of, of understanding and of awareness of the fulsome and complexity of human beings, and then ultimately just sort of having all of that feel like useless and burdensome knowledge in the face of your own pointlessness and mortality. My, my three favorite tracks are uh, Rat, Why Does the Earth Give Us People to Love, and Free. Um, that, that that really that whole midsection of the record from brain through to curtains is incredible. I guess yeah, if I had a, a least favorite moment, it would probably be the last track. But I kind of talked myself into appreciating it, which is not that unusual for me on this show. So yeah, um, the album's incredible. I I've only had it in my life for about three or four days, and I've listened to it four times. I still feel as though I have more layers to unpack. And as with many of the things we review on this show, the fullness of my appreciation just takes a lot longer than the boundaries that we impose on ourselves to talk about things on here. So by the end of the year, I'll have a really good idea, I think, of where this record sits for me in the wider pantheon of albums I love. But right now, it is top five of the year for me. Uh, very high, 8.5, verging on a 9. Again, need that time to let it simmer and process. But yeah, this one's a, this one's a good one. My three favorite tracks on here are No Fun slash Party, Rat, and Brain. Uh, least favorite track, uh, probably Pawn Shop. Uh, and I'll give the album a 7 out of 10. Let us know at home what you thought of either of the albums we've discussed today, Everything But The Girls, Fuse, and Kara Jackson's Why Does The Earth Give Us People To Love. Want to hear your thoughts, want to hear your takes on these particular records as well, how much they resonated with you, if at all, if you've heard them, if you haven't heard them, go and listen to them. If you enjoyed our breakdowns of these albums, let us know in the comments below and give us a like if you haven't already as well. Those things help us out a lot. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, of course, if you haven't subscribed already, that helps us out a lot too. Thank you to all the new people, subscribers we have. We've noticed our numbers really taken a big tick upwards lately, which has been great to see. So if you are someone who's been feeling new to the channel, or even if you've been around before, but you haven't left a comment or haven't left many comments, seriously, we'd love to hear from you. Please let us know what your thoughts are, or just let us know you're there in the comments below. It means a lot to us every time we see one of you. So yeah, but thanks for being here. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly for just $1 a month, you can hit the join button, become a member of the Jams D family, get your name and the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to talk about on the show, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Harley Davidson.
all for freedom, freedom for all.